Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to sort of build on what Angus has presented uh, by delving into uh, one example related to the ongoing problems with the dengue vaccine. I think many of you know that dengue is a major public health problem in many developing countries. Over 400 million people are uh, affected annually. And after about more than 30 years of research, a vaccine was, was finally developed. It was uh, first licensed in Brazil in December, December of 2015. And it is now licensed and approved in 20 countries in, in Asia and in, in Latin America. Um, two countries in particular, Brazil and the Philippines, have actually implemented the vaccine in public health uh, programs. In the case of the Philippines, uh, this took the form of a school-based immunization program uh, targeting nearly half a million children, launched in April of 2016. However, in November of 2017, the manufacturer warned that the vaccine can increase the risk of severe dengue in seronegative young children. Soon after, the government announced that it was going to suspend the dengue vaccination program on the latest alert from the manufacturer. Now, interestingly, and approximately at the same time, the State Department of Health of Paraná State in Brazil announced that they will maintain the offer of the vaccine against dengue in those areas that they have defined as being uh, in need of the vaccine. So the question is, what happened in the Philippines? Basically, what happened was the whole controversy escalated very quickly to the point that even the chief of the public attorney's office insisted that 60 kids died after receiving the vaccine. The controversy accused the government of committing genocide, having reckless disregard of citizens, and committing a scam masked as a public health program. There were insinuations of corrup corruption and conspiracy. And most distressing, especially from, from my own personal perspective, is personal and vindictive attacks against the Filipino scientists who took part in the initial clinical trials, the phase three trials to, prior to the approval of the vaccine. They were threatened with subpoenas and dismissal, and they were accused of doing bad science. The whole thing escalated to the highest level of government. A Senate hearing was con convened, which in the words of Heidi Larson uh, at the Vaccine Confidence Project, basically turned out into a witch hunt. So, Basically, uh, this is very nicely articulated about misinformation. Jonathan Swift said, falsehood flies and truth comes limping after it, so that when men come to be undeceived, it is too late, the jest is over, and the tale has had its effect. So th that is sort of in, in the context of what, what I I misinformation can do. But I also believe that... Um, we need to go a bit beyond this. So my question is, what was the enabling environment which allowed misinformation to be so damaging? And Angus has uh, highlighted some of these, and I'm just probably going to uh, reiterate what he said, maybe add one or two additional ones. Firstly, is a whole bunch of political, social, cultural factors. I'm not going to go into this, but it is particularly in this context important. The role of an irresponsible media, social media, as Angus had high highlighted, and of course the voice of the anti-vaccination groups. We are dealing with a sensitive and emotional issue fraught with moral and ethical concerns as it involves vaccination of healthy children. Okay, so that's perhaps another dimension of the enabling environment. Importantly, in the context of what happened, there was, I think, difficulty in conveying knowledge and information to the public and to the decision and policy makers as well. For example, you know, what exact, exactly is the nature of a clinical trial? That's not easy to explain to a layman. What are sort of the risk-benefit uh, perspectives? Another factor is the challenge 
in explaining that science is inherently uncertain. I'm going back here to sort of communication challenges that we can pick up later. Experts often see things differently. Anyway, what's an expert? And are often conflicted, as Angus mentioned about Andrew Wakefield. And this, of course, in the end, sends out confusing messages. Some of you may have read this book many years ago by Henry Pollack called Uncertain Science, Uncertain World. In the uh, endorsement to this book, Sir John Houghton, I think, sums it up nicely. Public policy debates are constantly getting stuck in the mire of perceptions about scientific uncertainty and risk. Yet, science is no different to many other areas of human experience in that uncertainty and risk are inevitably present. There was just one other one that I want to mention, and it's probably unique to the context of this dengue controversy, and that is the undue influence of foreign experts. I don't know how many of you come from my part of the world, but in many developing countries, there is this disturbing reality that we believe and listen to foreign experts that come to our countries rather than listening to our own people. And unfortunately, this is what, what, what happened in this particular case. A very prominent American dengue expert, I believe, had considerable influence in swaying the debate and perhaps actually fueling the controversy. Better not say any more. Okay, to their credit, to their credit, the Department of Health convened a dengue investigative task force, the ITF, to specifically look at the allegations that children had died because of the vaccine. They particularly focused on 14 uh, mortality cases amongst these children. What did they find after searching and sifting through the evidence? So this is an independent body of physicians and scientists convened by the department, and this is what they found. Out of the 14, three died of dengue shock syndrome. So that's probably a case of vaccine failure for whatever reason. Nine of them either had temporal or coincidental underlying causes, and two were unclassifiable. The investigations are still ongoing, but I think it's quite clear from here that there's no actually sound evidence that they died because of the vaccine. The report also highlighted the crucial role of the media and called on them to disseminate information from reputable sources, to discriminate statements that are given or that they hear to be their own detective, and to evaluate the implications of their news before disseminating it. What are the repercussions and avoid creating unfounded fears. So in conclusion, I hope I'm within my 10 minutes. First is that due to misinformation, Dengue vaccine is caught in the crossfire of politics, public policy, and public knowledge to the detriment of the health of citizens. Secondly, I think through transparency and accountability and based on the strength of scientific evidence, it is essential to build trust among the key stakeholders to reinforce what Angus said earlier. And my third conclusion is that to counter misinformation, it is important to reach out to media, to healthcare providers, to the public and the decision and policy makers to demystify science and clarify the altruistic and risk benefit dimensions of vaccination. Now, I think the controversy that I've highlighted around uh, the dengue vaccine uh, has been very, very polarized and obviously has created sort of two sides, one for vaccination and one against vaccination. But as Paul Offit once said, it's not about what side you take. It's about the data and what the science teaches us. And the controversy has also created fear and panic amongst the public and even among some of the decision makers. But as Tim Ferriss said, what we fear doing most is usually what we most need to do. Thank you.